Am I? Oh, I am live. Great. Well, thanks, everyone, for coming out to what already has a fantastic start as our DevOps panel. Exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. So I'm having some display issues, and that's good enough. That's all the slides said anyways, because I'm not here to give a presentation. That'll be later. Um, but what I am here to do is to quiz and, and hopefully maybe create a little conflict, because I think everyone's actually here for blood. At least, I don't, th I don't think we mentioned that on the call before, huh? Um, so the first thing that I, that I want to do is have everyone just go through and, and introduce themselves. And, and maybe mention a little bit about the perspective that they're coming from. And, and we're going to kind of focus around, you know, operations, what things matter in, in terms of operations and, and especially combined efforts between operations and development around OpenStack. So I guess if, if folks just want to start by introducing themselves. Yeah. Sure. And should we go into a bit, you know, a bit of background as well? Yeah, yeah just if, if you can just introduce yourself, maybe talk a little bit about, about kind of what technologies you're focused on and how that's that's driving your perception around DevOps. Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Mike Cohen. I'm director of strategic alliances at Big Switch Networks. We're a software defined networking vendor. Uh, we build a network virtualization application that has a quantum plugin um, that provides layer two, layer three um, you know, network virtualization um, al alongside OpenStack clouds. And the interesting, you know, the reason I actually wanted to speak on this panel and, and speak about DevOps is I actually believe SDN creates a very interesting opportunity for the DevOps community because it actually essentially takes the, the network domain, which had you know, essentially been very static and you know, limited to people with very, very specific knowledge, and really flattens it, normalizes it, and sort of wraps APIs around it. So you can actually now talk to this, you know, you know, either centralized or decentralized control entity and ask it what's going on in the network, ask it what the network looks like, ask it how traffic's flowing, all via REST APIs, and actually get reasonable answers back via JSON that you can actually parse and make decisions about. And that's very, very different than how networking had worked in the past, and I believe it creates a very interesting opportunity to pull DevOps folks into the fold and actually looking at um, create, you know, you know, creating different network management um, you know, mechanisms over time. Great. Hi, I'm Travis Tripp. I'm from HP. I'm a systems architect in the Converge Cloud uh, business unit. Um, my background is I spent about my first seven years at HP working on applications that were deployed into <coughs> HP's operations infrastructure, many of which were hosted on hp.com. And then I went into uh, working on enterprise software uh, products for HP that were very operations focused. So I spent some time uh, on a configuration management solution. It was a, definitely a, a lesson in scalability as our largest customer had a 400,000 device uh, set of systems that we manage from a central installation. Um, and then I moved into spending a couple years helping to launch a brand new product at HP called Continuous Delivery Automation. And that was a, a whole new set of challenges as we really were trying to embrace uh, openness as much as we could. So trying to pull in the, what we call the whole DevOps tool chain, going from everything from the continuous integration, your build systems, your source control, uh, up to your testing suites. Um, including, uh, we had integrations with Puppet, uh, Chef, all of HP's tools in this space, and then um, doing all the deployment and the monitoring. So we did everything from Nagios integrations up to, uh, and including a bunch of the HP products, like if you are aware of anything, like something called SiteScope. And so um, in that process, I had the opportunity to go out and actually talk to a lot, a lot of Fortune 200, 100 companies that were saying, hey, what's this whole DevOps, what's this whole agile delivery methodology all about? And some of the times it was, uh, we're going in there to try to get requirements from them, trying to get design partners. Sometimes it was about, we're trying to fulfill a proposal for them. And during that process, I definitely had some interesting experiences and, and some insights that took it from the whole automation technology side to the cultural side. So it's the, the culture aspects that uh, actually find to be as challenging at times as the as the automation tool sets. Hi everyone, I'm Kevin Jackson. I'm from Rackspace. Um, so my angle on all this is I see DevOps as an enabler for cloud adoption. 
So I spend a lot of time going around companies uh, and seeing how they're trying to um, move into a world where they have legacy processes, legacy systems, and you're trying to adopt basically private cloud technologies. Um, in a previous life, it was basically the same kind of role. You know, I've gone through the, the pains of working with developers in one side um, and managing the system administration team on the other side and seeing the, the many silos uh, within operations departments trying to work out how the hell do we work with a very ag agile development environment um, mixed with that lovely world of ITIL. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my take. So my, my take is trying to get to a world of um, understanding DevOps from, um, from how do we get from now to, to cloud through automated, automation. And I see um, if without automation, um, you don't really get to experience the full cloud um, world. You know, essentially if you, you go halfway, you automate some things, you basically just replaced your um, one virtualization uh, system with something else, but you slapped a stick on it called cloud. Uh, DevOps is an enabler to actually take that forward into a proper cloud world. And, and I'd say just for introductions, let's try to keep it a little bit more brief. Sorry for people on the end for getting, I guess, I guess ripped off time-wise. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Shriram Natarajan. I head the uh, cloud technologies practice uh, for Persistent Systems. Uh, Persistent Systems is a 22-year-old uh, software development company that's helped a lot of uh, uh, innovative companies launch their product onto the world. Um, just a quick uh, show of hands. How many in this room have their development operations and hardware in the same place, physical space? One. I see one, about two people in a room of, I believe, about 20, 30, 40 people. Uh, think about, uh, from our perspective, we have about 300 projects ongoing at the same time, and they're spread all over the world. So if you are, uh, we are at the cornerstone of agility, innovation, and vastly distributed teams. And we are proponents of DevOps, and we've kind of uh, used OpenStack to automate our own internal IT operations, and we also advocate the uh, use of DevOps to our customers to kind of get uh, get to success as quickly as possible. Hey folks, my name is James Pennick and I'm the uh, principal systems architect for Yahoo. Uh, my perspective on DevOps is that it is the glue that sort of bridges the gap between prototype and production. Uh, when you have, you have a development silo, then you have an operational silo, and you have DevOps that is the group that knows how to span both of those worlds and bring them together and negotiate and maintain that relationship. And I'm gonna go ahead and keep mine short. No, great, and I, and, I, and I do appreciate it so we can get, keep things moving on. And it, and it sounds like there's, there's just a, a general theme around, around people, I guess, automating different parts of the stack and, and, and kind of pushing culture for, for, for getting things combined. And I was just wondering, to, to start out with, what do people see as, as some of, of the barriers for, um, for acceptance of, of DevOps practices? I was gonna say one thing that I, I saw is there's too much silos within organizations. Um, just an example, I went into a very large company uh, and they were wanting to bring in agility into their practices and, and bring in DevOps. And so they bring us into the room and they start talking about, oh yeah, we're gonna enable, enable developers, we're gonna enable all this stuff. And then they go around the room and they start introducing who they are and it's like, oh, I'm this directory strateg director of strategy of operations and this guy of operations and this guy of operations. Like, okay, you don't have anybody represented from your development side of your testing organization, and here you are <laughs> gonna set your strategy for how you're gonna do DevOps. And it's like, you guys don't even get it from the get-go. You don't even, you're not even including the developers. You're not even including your testing and QA departments. And that's something that you have to consider. You're not doing this just as an operations staff. You're doing this for the developers and for QA. And so that's a big barrier I see is that people need to accept this. Do you, do you think that there's one side that, that, that it makes more sense to be driving DevOps initiatives? Or, or in, in, in people's experience, which, which side of the fence are they, are, are they coming from? Uh, just to answer your previous question, the, uh, I think the lack of ownership, I mean, there's no clearly defined owner that can take on the DevOps role, as he mentioned. 
it's typically operations people. Sometimes we see a lot of developers come in that are frustrated by the lack of uh, uh, agility on the ops side to deliver what they want. And uh, they pretty much want to take over. And it's uh, our role to kind of bring people together and say, and this is uh, kind of keep the gr grander goal in mind and you know, push people towards, all right, let's take the best of what you can offer, what your problems are, what you can bring to the table in terms of value, and then you know, thread the needle through, uh, through the various needles, thread the, through the various, various needles. Yeah, and so this is an issue I see you know, a lot in the SDM world is, you know, is we do deployments where, you know, you know, and there's some cases where we're working with kind of, you know, server teams and DevOps teams, um, and you know, there's other cases where we actually start working with networking teams, which tend to be not developer centric. They're you know, folks with very specialized skills around using CLIs um, and understanding networking protocols. And you know, where different IT infrastructure falls from a management um, you know, and ownership perspective becomes very important in that um, you know, if you, as we deploy, say, a, you know, an overlay technology which only touches the server, we, it may be easy to deploy where we can you know, pull in development-focused pe people very quickly. And as it starts needing to interact with the, you know, the, the physical network in some way, it actually creates a lot more friction because now we need to get both teams in the room. We need to convince them to work together and convince one that they're not ceding control to the other. Um, and that, you know, there's, a, there's a lot of friction in that process. And it actually slows down um, you know, creating a more agile infrastructure, which is what our goal was in the first place. I'm actually curious specific around SDN. I have a lot of, a lot of specific interest around, around SDN and how it relates to DevOps. Um, who do you feel, do you, do you feel that, that one specific side out of those kind of, it's moving from two players to three players in this scenario, do you feel one particular side is, is driving the innovation towards SDN and that another side is, is blocking or, or do you feel that everyone's on board or? I feel that everyone is on board, but they actually don't agree on with what they're on board with. Um, you know, the <laughs> you know the the reality is that um, you know, server administrators essentially want to be able to do things, uh, you know, and set things up so that they don't actually need to call the networking team to change things. So you know, if you look at the way networks would work, I wanna I wanna be able to you know write a script that spins up workloads anywhere in my data center dynamically. Now to actually make that function, I probably need to fire off a trouble ticket somewhere in between and have someone manually address that trouble ticket to actually connect, you know, you know, you know, provide the right kind of network connectivity somewhere in my data center. Now, th that's busted from a DevOps perspective, right? It doesn't actually work. So, um, you, you know, and, and networking teams actually don't necessarily want to see control of all those capabilities. They, you know, they want to be able to offer that function, but they don't necessarily want to not have control over it. So part of the challenge we have in SDN is actually offering a solution to both groups that actually you know, gives networking teams the visibility and, you know, and management and control over what's going on, but actually lets them delegate these kind of capabilities and expose them via an API so that folks can actually you know, have this kind of dynamic flexibility about where workloads are placed, for example. And, and I, I was also kind of curious, kind of, kind of passing a, a similar question to the rest of the panel, like, like which, which perspective of, of dev versus ops do you see yourself uh, pursuing the problem from? Just kind of, kind of curious about uh, about our audience here. I can say myself, um, I'm way more of a developer than an operations person. Uh, and I'm on the opposite end there. I actually come from a pure operational background originally, and then the the development stuff definitely came later. So I approached it from that perspective. Yeah, I've, I've come from um, the operations side as well. So um, I've I've seen a, a world where uh, it's kind of I think. From the operation side of things, you know, it's we we saw it as a educate dev in how to do stuff. Whereas I actually saw um, the operations team actually get a lot more out of it when they actually understood uh, how to do or how to manage the environment like a developer. You know, the the whole kind of utopian world of everything is code. Um, once they got to a world of managing their infrastructure uh, in that kind of sense, I saw some you know great benefits, which then fed back into the developer side. Yeah, I'm from the developer side myself. Typically what I see is uh, developers and ops when they meet, they each of them claim to be more process oriented than the other. One, one side comes and says, we need to have processes. The other side says, sure, we got processes of the Wazoo, so uh, what are you talking about? So typically it's the, the uh, agreement of what needs to mesh together is the problem. And uh, I, what we need to uh, identify is 
what pieces of process are going to make sense from the development angle, what pieces will make sense from the operations angle. Operations are typically, let's get the uh, lights on, let's keep the process going, uh, while the developers' uh, processes are focused on creating new uh, different features and kind of getting the better value out there. Uh, but we need to kind of balance the both the uh, endpoints of these processes to op op to choose which pro uh, process methodology you would like to adopt. So I, I definitely this working. <laughs> I definitely started purely looking at it from developer sites since I developed apps for a while, deploying deploying them, looking at IT, blaming them for everything, and they were looking at us for what do you mean? I was going for my my five nines, and you guys just keep screwing it up. But then you start looking at it and realizing when you talk DevOps, this is one things. Um, that we've talked to a bunch of companies at, about, it's, it's really a journey, it's an iterative process that you have to go through to, to reach that end game. And sometimes it makes sense for them to just start with uh, taking OpenStack and creating some OpenStack-based clouds and kind of mimicking their production environments in OpenStack so they can stand them up and tear them down and do their dev test processes that way and build up a level of trust that, hey, this thing can replicate our, our production environments, that we can uh, deploy into these things, and start building this up so that you can get your automation going all the way, because when you get to the end game, and yes, the company may have five levels of, of test phases, regression, functional, performance, CHO, all these things that they typically have to go through, but when they get a requirement in that something has to be out, this, like, in, in a half hour, which we had s several financial services talk about, you need to get to this automation point where you trust your systems. And you're not gonna get there overnight necessarily. You're not gonna trust your automation overnight, but you have to have to reach that point. And you may start with a dev test kind of scenario where you're spinning up environments in dev test, but getting to where you actually believe in your systems and your automation. So I think what, um, for, for people who have kind of the, the operations um, perspective, uh, what do you think developers can actually learn from your ops folks? Question. Um, one of the things that uh, our developers really, I think, benefit in the dev DevOps scenario is that when an operations person goes live, there's actually a series of, of steps they need to make sure, a little, little like a checklist that needs to, to come through. Uh, is it monitored? Is it reliable? Uh, where's the fault tolerance? And then the operations person also can, will usually bring to the table the perspective of scale, like what happens at scale? What happens when things break at scale? What are the unique and interesting ways that things shatter? And by bringing those to the devs, they can actually help set requirements to the devs and say these are the things you're going to encounter and what you're going to need to anticipate and resolve. And that gives uh, the devs something to actually work with. Yeah, in the DevOps uh, combination, one thing that keeps uh, that falls on the table is architecture. So if you don't have the architects on board that kind of guide through the scale and the design of the thing, so the developers probably know their little sandbox, but they don't kind of look at the overall picture. Ops also defines, okay, this is my five nines, but if it doesn't achieve anything, so it's no, no point. So you need to have architects at the table as well. And I, and I guess to flip it, what can the, the operations folks learn from the developers? I would say one of the big things that you know, the operations folks can learn from developers, you know, in my experience, is you know, a lot about you know, agility and innovation. And you know, um, you know, on, on the operations side, you're you know, you're measured on actually keeping things working, not necessarily, you know, not given as much credit for changing them, but making sure they don't actually break. On the development side, you're given credit for actually creating new things and creating new capabilities, um, you know, and, and enabling something that was not possible before. Uh, and I, I, you know, on a, you know, a bleeding together of those things, I think would be, you know, is, is really what we start, what we need now. I was curious too, since we have you here, um, what what can the ops and the developers learn from the networking folks? Yeah. So. Uh, so I would say, you know, uh, networking folks, you know, have have a lot to offer, you know, in that perspective, in that in that domain, in that they, uh, you know, you know, they have a ton of experience, f you know, running, you know, very very resilient systems and design, you know, architecting, you know, architecting around a lot of complexity and doing it in a way that is extremely resilient. Um, you know, one of the worst things that can happen in an operation domain is, you know, is networking going down. It brings everything. It brings everything to a halt. So you know, network. You know, the networking industry is designed, you know, a, a large number of standards um, and also a, a huge amount of training. You can go through a Cisco CCIE. Um, you know, there's a, a ton of very standardized training you can go through to understand how to interop. You know, how to manage. You know, a large number of very complex systems. 
Um, and then you know, on the DevOps side, really, uh, you know, it's a lot more, I don't want to say seat of your pants, but there's a lot more kind of, you know, anything goes, let's kind of put it together and, and, and see what works. And networking runs in a very, very different way. It's much, much more structured. Um, and as you start breaking down that structure, you, know, you lose some of the reliability, reliability that people have come to rely on. So I guess the next thing that I was wondering people's per perception on is, I often wonder if, if you know, especially the people at this conference and, and in the room are, are, are maybe, you know, the bleeding edge of what's going on, or do you think that this is going mainstream? Just in terms of, of these types of automation practices. I think it's going mainstream. We're, we're at the, we are at the bleeding edge, but it's definitely going mainstream. I mean, I, like I said before, I wouldn't have walked into these rooms with um, the super large, the biggest corporations in the world asking for this if they didn't see it going mainstream. Now, right now, maybe the CIOs are the ones kind of reading it in the magazine saying, hey, tell me what this DevOps thing is all about. But if they're looking at it, it means it's, it's, it's turning the corner. Yeah, I agree. There's, um, I certainly see it as mainstream. So, I mean, if you, if you look about, you know, a year, 18 months ago, people were talking about uh, DevOps being, um, well, it wasn't a role. You can't really define it. Now you actually look at all the jobs that are available. You actually ask for DevOps and engineers. Um, I think that kind of says that, you know, people actually want all this and it's actually mainstream and the skills, um, uh, there's jobs out there for these type of skills. I was, I was wondering if, if someone could, could pick, and I know this is kind of a lame question, but it's going to be fun. Uh, if, is, could people say, what, what do they think is the most important tool for DevOps? The human. There's, there's, I think there's too much focus on um, on the tools. You know, there's um, there's a lot of people going, "Hey, I run I run Puppet, I run Chef." You know, that does not make you a DevOps house. That just makes you efficient. Um, what actually helps with DevOps is actually getting humans to actually talk to one another. You know, it's getting the ops guys to talk to the dev guys. Um, that's 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 your main tool. Yeah, I'll play to the crowd and say, after the humans comes OpenStack. <laughs> <laughs> what? Why is that? Yeah, uh, pandering? Uh, well, pandering has got a lot to do with it. Uh, we use OpenStack internally to uh, run a lot of our operations, and we've had a lot of success kind of not reinventing the wheel in terms of uh, uh, provisioning nodes, setting it up, and uh, kind of being able to shut them down once the project is over and all that stuff. So there's a lot of things that come out of the box that uh, we've uh, used internally. Actually, the, probably the greatest tool for, for DevOps would actually be any automation tooling they use, because that's uh, when you when you have the DevOps folks that are automating the op the processes for the the straight operations people, that makes their job easier. And then, then when things are not easy for them to automate or represent a serious problem in the in the product, then that's a requirement they can then feed into the developers. And you know, I, it, I'll probably stick with Puppet and Chef as the the greatest tools for DevOps. Although you know, I mentioned before that SDN actually can be a very interesting new tool for DevOps as well, because it can actually give you APIs into a, you know, a part of your infrastructure that you never were able to touch before, never really able to modify. Um, so I definitely encourage, you know, I definitely encourage folks after this to kind of investigate some of the stuff going on with open source SDN controllers and the kind of things you can manipulate, because I think you'll find a new tool that can actually be you know, a very enabling technology. So I think, how does, so we, we, we talked about, about OpenStack and, and I guess more generically um, infrastructure as a service APIs. Um, how how does that I guess play into DevOps in general? How how is it an enabler of that? Well, I know that uh, from my early experience working with uh, getting things on HP.com, if we wanted to get new environments set up, it took a very long time. <laughs> it was very slow. And with your new, the APIs, everything basically being exposed to you as a developer, um, your operations staffs could create, you know, standardized environments for you that mimic their production environments that can help you. Or they can just give you direct access and say, hey, here's your account. You guys want to request uh, some new infrastructure to go and play with it? Fine. So it gives you, it gives you so much more flexibility and agility. I think one of the one of the greatest things about infrastructure as a service in general is the ability of DevOps and, and operations to actually get out of the way. Um, you know, we we don't want to be a blocker for developers to do their job. We just want them to do their job. Our our job is to 
give people access to our resources. And whether or not that that's our customers on the outside or our developers on the inside, one way or another, we have to connect people to these things. And when we stand between our developers and getting their job done, that's a position we never want to be in. And so infrastructure as a service gives us the ability to say, you know, you need resources, we define quota, whatever, however your system works, and then you hand it over and you say, great, you do it yourself. The other thing I think that's um, you know becoming more prevalent and working really well the, the, is the the plug-in model. You know, um, it's happening. You know, it happened in, in networking. It's happening in storage. The idea that you can actually you know there's a, a high-level abstraction layer that lives inside OpenStack, and beyond that can live any number of implementations. And you can actually create you know cook up your own implementation on top of a vendor solution. You can cook up something on top of open source. You can cook up something fully homegrown, and then you can connect it to OpenStack via relatively standard APIs. And I think that is a very, very useful ability. I was, I was actually wondering, do, do people have experience with, with, let's say, indicators that a company might be um, culturally destined to fail at, at, at DevOps? Uh, I'll, actually, I'll say pride is probably the biggest thing. When, you, when, you still, when you're trying to form DevOps, but you still find yourself managing two very prideful, uh, arrogant organizations, you are going to be destined to fail. You know, the only way these things work is when everyone kind of puts aside their self-importance and realizes that they, they are not the most important thing, the most important part of the organization. The buck doesn't stop there. They're just one more part of the great machine that is the whole organization. Yeah, and the other aspect I would add is, you know, th there's an ownership, you know, anytime you see a battle for ownership going on, you know, we have customer meetings where, you know, it's not clear who, which group we should be talking to or the, you know, the fact that, you know, you know, the, the groups disagree about how things should be done and don't, and, and don't want to get in a room with each other, um, you know, that's a very bad sign. And you know, it, it makes it very, very hard for them to work together. It makes it very, very hard for them to agree on how any kind of API handoffs would work or how any kind of automation technology would, would string together. I have a, a specific example, a different company. I mean, they're talking with and they, it's the operation staff again, so that's an indica indicator. They don't have the rest of the company in there. but. They're talking about automation tools. And we find out that they actually had an HP solution that they were using called application lifecycle management that uh, could, could deploy some lab on demand infrastructure. And we asked these guys, do you guys, do you guys use this? Does this matter to you? And the operators guys go, no, that's the testing. We don't care about that. <laughs> so it's just an indicator when they just sit there and basically talk to the hand when you get outside of my, my production space. So I was I was interested just just in general what do what do people think about about I guess monitoring or or, or specific types of, of, of tooling around monitoring or, or, or just general processes that that are, are going to lead to more automation success. Oh, it's vague on purpose. Fill it in. Uh, all right, I'll, just, I'll just take whatever direction I want with it then. Um, you know, one of the, the great things about monitoring is that it, uh, uh, big page sucks a lot. And uh, we have, uh, we have some, you know, uh, I'm fortunate to work on a team of very, very smart people. Um, and one of them has actually gone through extreme efforts to make, uh, to automate as much of our, our paging as possible. So not only now when something goes wrong, are we, does someone get alerted, but does it come up in, in an IRC channel where you can acknowledge it from there by giving the bot a command. But from there, we can also start to examine other things. Uh, for example, if one of our uh, clusters is starting to run low on IPs, we can automatically kick off a request for more IPs. So by automating our, our automation you know, and, and adding additional tooling to it, we can actually try and get a little bit closer to a Skynet-like operation. Yeah, I've, um, so before um, this, this company I used to work for, before we got to a world which was a little bit more DevOps, um, you know, there was the traditional monitoring, you know, so all your, your, your NADIOS systems, that kind of stuff, and you kind of hoped that that actually told you the full story. Um, moved into a world where a team was a lot more successful in understanding um, DevOps and actually had the guys actually talking to the operations staff and vice versa. And we got to a world where we had very specific monitoring in place. Um, this was to do with classified adverts, so we could actually see when things were going bad, when adverts start dropping off the, off the site. So instead of having like very generic kind of, hey, the web servers are running, we went to down to the level of detail very specific for the application. And I don't think we'd ever get there if we didn't get these two teams to actually talk to one another. I was actually curious, what do, what do people think, you know, what are people's opinions around tools for, for multi-node orchestration? 
just curious, what are people's kind of favorites, things that they tried that they didn't like? Multi-node orchestration? Uh, Multi-node orchestration for actually, you know, things, I, I mean, heat would be a, a, a prime example. I, I, I guess what is, what's the place for things like heat? And, and I'm just curious what other tools people know and, and, and what tools like that people have had success with. Yeah, so the, the um, one that I've seen um, a fair degree of success, um, both, I have a, I'm sorry for right scale, but I have a love-hate relationship with those guys. But, um, you know, I've seen some, some good stuff um, from, from there um, at this particular organization. But I've also seen the fact that, you know, we've, um, you can get very quickly locked into those kind of things and just try and undo some of that work to move to something else was, was a pain. But whilst it was going good, it was very good. So I, so I guess, oh, oh go ahead. I say, to, be, to be frank, most of what I've seen has actually been homegrown, you know, homegrown solutions that people have layered on top of existing things they had. Um, you know, and they've been using Puppet or Chef, and, you know, but it's actually, it, it's actually ended up being very homegrown. Um, and sometimes it's worked well and sometimes it hasn't. But a lot of people, you know, most of what I've seen so far has been people cooking up their own. So, so I think that, that leads to uh, a pretty good given that, that maybe, maybe people have less answers about that specific um, topic. What are, what are the unsolved problems of automation or of, or, or of DevOps? You know, what, are the, what are the next things that need to be solved? So uh, I'll actually jump back to your last question while we were asking about heat. Sure. <laughs> and that's actually a particular interest of mine right now. Uh, I've been in participating in all the heat sessions. And also I have been sitting in on a, a Tosca board for Oasis topology orchestration for uh, cloud applications and looking at some camp specs. And it kind of leads into your next question. And it's one of the things that we look at and say, there's, there isn't really one single tool that handles everything today. And, and one reason for that is that there's really different needs. There, you go into some organizations and the people are going to want to be down at the very low levels. They're going to want to script everything. Um, and that's fine, that works great for them. Then you have some people that they need to have higher level visibility. They need to understand things from a kind of a more logical level, see how this thing all maps around. and and. Some companies, seriously, they don't want to have everything at, at such a low level of orchestration like Heat may provide you today. They, they may desire a higher level uh, type of, of thing that they can walk up and show their boss and he understands that uh, the application view of things versus the infrastructure view of things and he can visualize it. And so I think that this is an area that is a big dialogue right now and it's the orchestration tool set and I think it is, is kind of the next big thing. Coming back to the question, what's next for DevOps? I mean, I don't completely agree with uh, that uh, DevOps has gone mainstream. It's getting there, but it's quite a ways to go. But I think it'll get there. And the next question that's going to come up is, what is the value that it's providing you? It's going to become more, uh, what people, from the company's perspective, is going to be, what has been a cost center has been married to a value center and I, I need to see what value I'm deriving from it, what is the innovations that's coming out of it. And we, the people that are kind of becoming the VP of DevOps need to be very fine-tuned and aware of what value they are bringing. And they need to keep very constant and frequent metrics on that. Yeah, I think that's where it's going. So I guess what are, what are, what are some of the, oh sorry, did you want to jump in? Uh, what are some of the skill sets that, that you think people need to be DevOps? Um, and, and, and do you think that those skill sets are, are overall lacking in the market? I think I would say the two, two of the, the key skill, the most key skill set I think you need is actually personality and charisma. I mean, you have to ability because you really do need to operate between these two worlds and try and bind these two groups and make them get along and help them maybe get over themselves. Um, on top of that, you need, you need automation skills. You need development skills to understand where the developers are coming from. And you need operational skills to understand what the problems are when deploying in an operational environment, you have to be able to help anticipate some of these problems. But I think the key, most key skill is still the personality to to kind of help everyone get along a little bit. And I, th I think it's absolutely essential, you know, that folks in this world, they've, you know, if you've either spent time in the operational world or you at least, um, you know, intimately understand that space because, you know, the, the requirements of, you know, the, the uptime requirements, the kind of SLAs you have to deliver for, you know, you know, are, you are, are extremely high and different than you probably you know, dealt with in a tr more traditional development environment. Um, and you really need to understand that the tools you're building, the kind of automation you're designing, you know, has to stand up and someone will get paged if it doesn't. And you actually think 
you know, that's that's a shift from the average developer and, and the way they operate. So, I guess from my perspective, this will be a slightly loaded question from my perspective, but it but it feels like DevOps has evolved um, out of Ruby, and now you know we're sitting here representing OpenStack, which is evolving out of Python. So, how do those two things come together? They're both object oriented. So, as long as you're <laughs> trained in your objective, you're going to be fine. But is that it? Is it is it if you want to do DevOps, then then you should all, you should program in, in both Python and Ruby. I, I think that's actually an important skill, uh, but it doesn't have to just be Python and Ruby. There's plenty of large enterprises that have a lot of tools that feed into their dev systems. They're still based in in Java and other languages. So I don't think that you can just say if you're DevOps, you have to be Ruby and, and Python only. If you want to be playing in the Chef and and uh, particularly Puppet space, OpenStack, then right now, yeah, it's Python and Ruby. Do you think it's 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 reasonable? I mean, it's not it's not just about programming languages, right? It's about an entire tool chain, right? It's it's mocking and stubbing tools and, and unit test frameworks and you know I guess virtualization automation tools. You know, do you think that you know do you think that that's reasonable to say that actually all of us should should be able to simultaneously work in all these development environments? I think you're assuming that um, you're assuming there that it's all development. Um, oriented being DevOps. So I think um, some some key skills about DevOps is actually uh, fundamentally understanding ops. But to have, um, I think you just need a, more of an appreciation and an understanding of a language rather than actually knowing the language to be DevOps. You know, you don't have to be a developer to be de DevOps. You'd be an ops guy who just has a very good appreciation of um, what can and cannot be achieved in the development uh, environment. I guess uh, we we have a microphone there, so if anyone wants to wants to stand up and, and fire questions at us, I think that's that's pretty reasonable. We'll get people. Uh, I think we have a mic. If you want to, can I, you? I said shout really loud. Yeah, shout shout really loud. Um, from from yeah, so this is the OpenStack conference. Um, from your point of view, yeah, thinking of where OpenStack is today or where it's going six months from Havana, what, what do you think are the big gaps for for people who operate OpenStack or people who run OpenStack in terms of automation, tooling? Is this even being recorded? Uh, the the question from from David was, what tools, what automation tools are missing in the OpenStack ecosystem? Even though I don't see a camera, so maybe I don't even have to re-ask. I don't know if it's an automation tool, but the ability to upgrade OpenStack is a is a big problem. So that's something that needs to. Uh, been, Rob Hirschfeld had a very great talk on that uh, yesterday, which I think was great. Upgrading is obviously one of the big ones. Deployment is another one. Heat is trying to address that, and um, I'm I'm watching that cautiously and see which direction it's going to go. Um, but when you think in terms of needing to deploy, you know, a 20,000 node cluster, you start to really be concerned about how you do it uh, and how you present a, a a high SLA to your users, and that's when uh, uh, other tooling like uh, secure methods of live migration, all these other things that really come into day to day instance management. Uh, uh, really come into play. I, I can't even resist commenting on this one. I mean, I mean, for me, the the most important gap that's actually being filled right now is we really need to start collaborating on continuous integration as a service. And I've had a lot of a, a lot of spent a lot of time in the last month, like understanding Zool and and OpenStack DevGate and sorry, I know I'm say, saying it wrong, but kind of everything that's going on in in, in in OpenStack Infra. And I really hope that that going forward, companies can stop building their own CI systems and and start collaborating on around centralized uh, CI as a service. And uh, you know, the, the the aspect I would add on the networking front is you know, we've actually seen a lot of work that's coming, you know, coming right now on the quantum side around network services. So you think about firewalls and load balancers and you know, there's a lot of devices that live um, you know, essentially outside the OpenStack domain today or the OpenStack domain today and you know, they they need to be you know, essentially virtualized and available um, you know, in a programmatic way to, to you know, to tenants and to tenant networks. And that's one of the things that you know, we're trying to tackle in the quantum world at this point. Uh, we have another question? What, what's the real uh, attribution of the remote node in uh, uh, the agile world? I, uh, at work, I sometimes say that IPv6 is this giant monster just on the other side of the horizon that everyone knows exists, but, but everyone thinks it's, it, it, we can wait till next week. It's only for um, now, right? <laughs> We're, you know, IPv6 is kind of a big deal uh, where, where I'm coming from, and uh, definitely looking forward to seeing better integration and support instead of OpenStack. Any, 
Any other questions? Someone just shout out because I'm having a lot of trouble seeing. Oh, wait, perfect. Now I can see all of you. Any other any other questions from the audience? Yes? Oh, and we have a microphone. Thank you for, for using our microphone. So, uh, you guys have danced around uh, defining what DevOps is. You've claimed that there is no real canon of software that has to be there for DevOps. So now I'm going to ask you, what's your elevator speech for what is DevOps as opposed to what is not? Can you do that in one sentence? I gave mine already. <laughs> DevOps is the, like I said earlier, is the bridge that, de that, that, that combines the, the developer silo and the operational silo. It's a group of people that have skills that fall on both sides of the aisle. It doesn't really say what's there and what's not. They're really smart nerds. <laughs> <laughs> I think a DevOps is the collaboration using uh, automation techniques to rapidly deploy software and to stand up infrastructure um, in a way that uh, enables faster time to value for your business. Yes. Thinking about cell phones, for a minute, and the low voice quality we have now come to expect from voice communication. There's a trade in DevOps between reliability and speed of getting it done. And you guys seeing an erosion of quality in the operations environment in order to enable a faster I, again, it's hard for me not, not to jump in here. I mean, I think no. I mean, I think that, that one of the Actually lessons, you want to again, the question? for me. There is a, there oh, is oh, a camera. Oh, oh, there is a camera. Oh, the, oh, the question is, is you know, does this kind of, you know, is there an erosion in, in overall quality of service because we're, we're combining uh, developers and optimizers? And, and, and I guess it kind of hints to, is there this inherent compromise that's, that's going to come out of it that, that erodes the overall service quality? And I can't help but jump in and say, I think it actually Im improves service quality because it's, it's, it's taken the operational expertise and it's forcing everyone to start thinking about building everything as a service, which I think <coughs> leads to building fully automated platforms for delivery as opposed to ad hoc processes for delivery. Yeah. Uh, I, I think dev the purpose of DevOps is to prevent the erosion of either of those, right? The purpose of DevOps is to understand both perspectives and find a way to make them both work. So I guarantee you that even before you get to DevOps, that people were putting bad code out into production. And <laughs> with DevOps, the theory is you can get your fix in faster. And just like this week, I got an update on my mobile app from, I think, Comcast, I think. <laughs> I don't know if he's in the audience. but And it had a bug, and my battery drained. The next morning, there was another update. Oh, and the little tagline said, fixed bug that was deployed in the last version. And part of that's because they were deploying it to production and d getting that app out there and the services that back that app faster. I don't think there's going to be erosion in value. It's just the means to measure the value have to kind of keep up with the pace of innovation that's happening in DevOps. And pretty soon you will see that the value that's, that you get out of DevOps is much more than what you did in your traditional silos. I, I generally agree with what's been said. You know, I will have the caveat. There's a, there's a right way to do things and a wrong way to do things. When done correctly, DevOps can actually make things better in that it actually can lead to more automation. And t you, know, you create a, an automatable process, you can now test it better and deploy it more cleanly than you would have before. You know, that's things done correctly. Things done incorrectly, you say, you see to your pants, you can do whatever you want, and you start rolling out random things, and you can actually make things worse. So it, it doesn't necessarily prescribe that things are better or worse. It actually depends on how you do it. DevOps still has the notion of release gates. It doesn't, it doesn't mean <laughs> In some shops, maybe it means I press a button and it automatically goes through, but there still is a notion of release gates, of going, this thing goes through this QA process to this QA process, and this build is actually approved to, to be pushed out into production. So just because you say DevOps doesn't mean there's no such notion as a release gate and no such thing as quality. I think, are we, is, is our stop point 40 after? Not that I can even see anyone to you. Oh. Yeah, uh, great. Well, thank you, everyone, for, for coming. And, and especially, can we get a, a round of applause, applause for our, our great panel who was, was nice enough to answer some questions for us?